I have the privilege of uh, chairing this discussion. I'm Robin Mansell from the London School of Economics and Political uh, Science. My research is on regulation and policy and internet governance, and most recently on digital platform um, related legislation, as well as social, geopolitical, and technical implications of standardization. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by the Oxford Global Society. This is an Oxford-based non-political think tank which focuses on contemporary issues of global interest. It welcomes people who are interested in its mission and have an academic research or industry background. And its team joins from anywhere in the world and from whatever career stage they are at. I want particularly to thank uh, Zhufang Wang, Deputy Director of the Society for her work in organizing this webinar and contact information for the Society can be found on its website. A big welcome to our panelists and discussants for what we hope will be a very vigorous uh, debate on issues around the development of global standards for critical and emerging technologies, which you see on the slide are abbreviated as CETs. 5G and AI standardization are debated widely these days in the US, in Europe, and China. So the questions that we're putting today in brief are, does standardization in these areas raise new or distinctive questions? Do values play a role in standardization? What or should be the national security or ethical concerns? What is or should be the role of the state? And what are the challenges for international cooperation? And finally, how does geopolitical competition impact on countries in the global south? We've asked our speakers to focus on some of these questions, as you see on the screen. But before they speak, I intend to introduce our panelists and discussants in the order in which they will or have agreed to speak. They'll make initial, initial approximately five minute remarks, and then we'll open the debate. In a final segment, we will open to questions from our audience. And so you should feel free to send those questions along at any time during the webinar. Our first speaker this afternoon, this evening, or this morning, depending on where you are in the world, is Professor Milton Mueller, who is at the Georgia Institute of Technology and the School of Public Policy and the School of Cybersecurity and Privacy in the US. He specializes in political economy, of information and communication and is the founder and director of Georgia Tech's Internet Governance Project, which has helped to shape policy in the US and abroad. Our next speaker will be Mr. Thomas Lee, who is president of international standardization at Huawei. He is the founder of Huawei standardization and industry department, and he has substantial experience of standard strategies for 4 and 5G, and is board member of several international standardization organizations. Our third speaker will be Professor Andrea Renda. He is Senior Research Fellow with the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels and the Professor of Digital Policy of the European University Institute in Florence. At the Center in Brussels, he directs the research group on global governance regulation and innovation in the digital economy, and he regularly advises policy institutions. Dr. June Park, is Fung Global Fellow of the Institute of International and Regional Studies at Princeton University. Uh, she is a political economist and works on trade, energy, and technology conflicts, and particularly on data governance and emerging technologies. She serves as an expert for global consulting firms and advises think tanks in the US and abroad. Dr. Basong Ang is Associate fellow at the Chinese, China Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation of the Ministry of Commerce. He was head of the Chinese delegation to the WTO negotiations on technical barriers and standardization, and he specializes in standardization policy regulation and international law. These are our five panelists. We have two discussants. The first is Dr. Scott Kennedy, who is Senior Advisor and Trustee Chair in Chinese Business and Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in the US. His expertise includes industry policy, technology innovation, and business lobbying, and he is an authority on US-China commercial relations and governance. And lastly, our second discussant is Claire Milne, who is an independent consultant with direct 
experience with standards. Recently, as a consumer representative through the Consumer Public Interest Network of the British Standards Institution, and in the past in relation to ITU uh, T study group two on numbering and other aspects of telecom network interoperability. As you can see, we have a very, very experienced panel. They come from different points on the geographical um, compass and they have different expertises and I hope that we will learn tremendously from them. Without anything more from me, can I invite our first speaker, Milton Mueller, to begin? Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good to see you again, Robin, and uh, it's great to be involved in this program. So our topic contains two things that I think we need to disambiguate, uh, <clears throat> the idea of standardization or technical standards, and this idea of critical emerging technologies, which is a very loaded term that I'll uh, explain the progeny of uh, later. So this uh, needs to be put in a broader context. Uh, the new focus on CET comes from a major shift in policy where the US, Europe, and China seem to have lost sight of the way neoliberal globalization put interoperable networks, digital devices, data, and software in the hands of almost everyone in the world at incredible speed. Starting in the 80s, throughout the 90s, and continuing until about 2010, we built a very open global digital ecosystem, and now we're turning away from that. So I call that turn away uh, digital neo-mercantilism. I see it as a reactionary policy movement, a kind of a counter-revolution in which nation states are abandoning the globalized market-driven digital ecosystem and trying to subordinate technology to their national political and military ends. Uh, it melds trade protectionism and domestic industrial policy with national security claims. And a chief driver of this has been the US-China rivalry, or more specifically, the US fears that it is no longer winning uh, sort of the global uh, economic competition. Now, technical standards are not actually the main battleground of digital neo-mercantilism. Standards by their nature seek cooperation and compatibility. The ICT standards that matter most are still set by non-governmental entities, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, IEEE, and mobile telecom standards for 3G, 4G, and 5G were largely set by an organization known as 3GPP, which combines national standards organizations from Japan, China, India, Europe, South Korea, and the US. Now it's true there are some distributional conflicts around vendors' patent rights in these standardization processes, uh, but no country has a patent monopoly extending across all components of 5G systems. So the so-called new IP is a recent indication of how silly uh, attempts to politicize standards can be. Uh, we're having a big debate about whether this is a good or a bad standard when there is no standard. <laughs> it's not a defined standard. It's a slogan or a direction that Huawei would like to pursue. And in some sense, it's actually a solution in search of a problem. At any rate, any major shift in the world's internetworking standard would take at least a decade to be agreed upon and two or three more decades to disseminate. So there's no immediate threat from the mere idea of a new AP, yet American interests are fostering fears that this non-standard will spread Communist Party authoritarianism. Now, let me turn to the idea of CET and I'll wrap up in a, in a minute or two. Um, the whole notion of, uh, a um, <clears throat> critical and emerging technology is a labeling ploy designed to expand the US government's control over technology exports and foreign investment. And this in turn is a reflection of its paranoia about losing hegemony to China and reflects a, a really poorly thought out idea that we can somehow arrest the economic development of a foreign country as large and self-sustaining as China. In other words, it's a pure manifestation of digital neo-mercantilism. There is no scientific definition of an emerging technology and there never will be. This is a historical phenomenon that uh, you really don't know what's emerging until it's emerged. Uh, yet this policy train has gathered enormous momentum in the US. 
In the past, export controls were applied to technologies underpinning specific known weapon systems. But in 2018, we passed new laws regarding export control and the regulation of foreign investment, which ex drastically expanded the scope of control to something called emerging and critical technologies. Now, if you look at the list of CETs distributed by the US National Science and Technology Council, you have a, a really amusing list of essentially any and every ICT on the planet. It's AI, cloud computing, hardware, firmware, and software, undersea cables, I could go on. Most of these are mature technologies, not emerging ones, but that's missing the point. The list gives the US government and the prevailing China hawks a blank check to interfere in any R&D projects, any markets, any capital raising effort that they fear might develop competition in a foreign land. So I'll leave it there and uh, hope we can have a good discussion of these issues as we go on. Thank you very much, Milton. Um, you highlight both the history and the deep controversy around um, these developments. I just have one question for you. Do you know whether or not there is a counterpart list that exists in China, which is technologies that they consider to be critical in some sense? Yes, there is. It's not uh, quite the same. Um, uh, China has its, you know, its national plans where they identify critical technologies that they want to become dominant or self-sufficient in. <clears throat> and um, this, you know, uh, obviously China is a mercantilist in its uh, economic policy. I think what we often forget, however, is that um, many of these efforts have been unsuccessful. And when they have been successful, they really are more about international companies like Huawei responding successfully to the market rather than, uh, you know, the massive subsidies that we've seen for something like SMIC, the uh, semiconductor manufacturer. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let us turn to our next speaker, who is Mr. Thomas Lee from Huawei. Would you like to go ahead, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Tui, can you share uh, the screen on the uh, question list? Uh, and that everybody can see that. I'd like to, you know, follow the questions and one by one. Okay. So for the first question, I think, uh, uh, the CET's uh, standardizations, of course, is different. Uh, it's quicker, it's more inno innovative and more influential, but it's okay because there is uh, uh, already established the international standard framework for CETs, for example. If you look at 5G, you can see we have ITUR working on the spectrums and uh, technology selection. And also uh, for the AI, uh, for, for strategy, also we have 3GPP to develop the standards. For AI, we have JDC1 SC42 as well. That is a good framework for cooperation uh, internationally. So I don't see any problem here unless somebody trying to break it. For the second question, the answer is basically no. Uh, just take the uh, example of Huawei uh, itself. Uh, at least 10 years ago, we already uh, submitted, uh, uh, submitted uh, more than 5,000 contributions per year to all different kind of uh, uh, global uh, stand bodies, uh, including 3GPP, ITUT, uh, IETF, IEEE, and uh, uh, hundreds of them. We are great contributors, we are not ch challengers because we, we, we follow the procedures and the uh, uh, follow the rules of the organizations. We don't break it. So I don't know why we have this question here. And uh, talk about the values. You know, if we're talking about the value of standards like uh, inclusive, like uh, transparency, openness, it's okay. But if, if we're talking about uh, human rights, uh, freedom or socialism or capitalism. I'm sorry, my question, my, my suggestion is that uh, don't do that. Don't uh, bundle these values with standards because uh, the definition of these concepts are very different from country to country. If we put that in standards, we were facing the unstopping uh, argument maybe for decades. 
without end maybe never have a consensus. So I'd like to uh, suggest we decouple all these so-called values with technical standards, and we will have a more efficient way to go to the global standards. So the, the third question, how much room for international cooperation? I believe it's a lot. Uh, we can imagine the the bad, the, the worst uh, situation we, we would face, like uh, China only do business with uh, Russia, and the US is only do business with Europe. I'm sorry, that is a very bad situation, and uh, it, it, it's, it's a disaster. We nobody uh, looking forward on that. Uh, only when uh, we we have a strong business between China and the United States and Europe, that means we have a lot of rooms for international corporations between West and China. But unless somebody is going to break it, okay. For the question four, that of course, uh, there is a strategic importance of standards, of course, everybody noticed that. But if we say state intervention, uh, maybe, but uh, I think the uh, so-called uh, connection between uh, policy and regulations with standards uh, always exist all the time. So it's, new, it's not new, but if we put more values, we so-called values uh, into standards, I think that is bad. We, uh, my suggestion is we keep the values on uh, the country's uh, self regulations and policies and put the consensus building of technologies into standards. Don't mix it up. Uh, and uh, in, in today's, uh, for the question five, what's the main challenges? Of course, it's not, uh, it's not China. <laughs> we, we heard that uh, uh, EU, US uh, has a trade uh, technology council, uh, which is trying to define standards with so-called like-minded countries. If I may, I'd like to uh, contribute a new word here, like-minded standards. That is ironic because we all know that the spirit of standardization is to put unlike-minded person together to reach consensus as possible as we can. But what does the like-minded standard mean? It's, it's nothing, it's a, it's, a it's a real challenge for the global standards and the city standards as well. The last question is about what are the impact of the current geopolitical uh, uh, competition that uh, uh, on the rest of the world, uh, like global south, I think that's a, uh, a big challenge because uh, for, for global south, most of the countries don't have the uh, technical competence to join in the technical discussion of the uh, CET standards or ICT standards. So they are followers. But if we have uh, fragmented standards, global standards, that's a great challenge for them. It's uh, not easy for them, it's, it's, it's bad. So the, they, they may choose the wrong choices or they may uh, uh, forced to join different uh, uh, campaign. Uh, not good for them. So let me add one more thing uh, after all these questions that why fragmented standard will, will happen. Uh, in my understanding, there are two major scenarios. The first one is that the industry itself is already fragmented. That means the standards naturally to be uh, fragmented. Nobody can stop that. Another thing is about, we all, all know the major value of a standards is that uh, to avoid, to avoid uh, vendor lock-in. If, the, uh, if the, the standards means no vendor lock-in, I think it's okay, it's good, it's a good standard. But uh, it means there is only one vendor in the market or all the vendors or technologies come from one country and that country is very good on sanctions and uh, anti least or something like that. That were disaster for the business. It's a, it's a huge business risk, just like uh, Huawei is facing right now. So 
that will also naturally to uh, achieve fragmented standards because if the existing standards, uh, the uh, the existence behind that, the supply chain behind that cannot support the company. The company should choose another standards. That's that's for survival. It's for, for nothing else. Uh, naturally happen. So that's my uh, you know general understanding of all the questions. I'd like to have uh, more discussion later with your guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. Um, I hear what you say about values, and perhaps we'll come back to that in the discussion. Uh, but just a, a point of clarification, if you might to um, elaborate a bit more, how do you see it as being feasible to keep values out of the picture oh, behind the it, door? Yeah, it's. Uh, I already find out some way here. Uh, for example, the artificial intelligence. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of uh, uh, metrics on the AI, like accountability, like transparency uh, or security or privacy protection in, in, in standards. So these kind of things are more, as, as far as I know, it's more technically that we can define it, we can have consensus over there. And uh, if we go to values, maybe different country have a diff different uh, weight of these metrics. Some country may have a high, much higher uh, weight on privacy uh, protection. Some country would, would uh, have a lower one. So we leave that differences for the all countries, their own policies and regulations. They can put that kind of factors on values over their own policy and the regulation, but I think it's a bad idea to force other country to follow them. So I believe we technically can have a way to decouple these two parts to, to avoid conflictions. Does that answer the question, Robin? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, can we take down the slide now so that people can see each other better? Thank you. We'll turn now to Professor Andrea Renda. Andrea, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Robin, and thanks for having me in this uh, fascinating discussion already. I reshuffled my thoughts a little bit after having heard uh, uh, Milton and, and Thomas. Uh, and perhaps I start a little bit uh, where Thomas has ended. Uh, um, but first, a series of consideration. First of all, critical emerging technologies. In my opinion, uh, we can already differentiate between those technologies for which standardization is to some extent a defining foundational moment, if you wish. You cannot really proceed without at least an ongoing standardization process. And, and that is the case of 5G. It's already starting to be the case of 6G. And perhaps it will prove in the years to come a useful natural experiment, let's say, to see uh, how uh, fragmented or cohesive will the, the 6G uh, uh, pooling of patents and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, definition of overall standards. Uh, there are other technologies for which the market develops and then you uh, and then the, the, the world seeks to, to establish standards. And I think that is the case for artificial intelligence where the standardization largely uh, uh, follows uh, an initial set of developments in the market, right? And, uh, and there we see, in my opinion, some of the most interesting traces of how the world is developing uh, in uh, the, the overall technological ecosystem, but also specifically on standards. Um, in the case, so the timing is different, uh, but in the case of technologies such as AI and all those technologies that present themselves as dual use, general purpose, and increasingly pervasive, uh, the problem is uh, how to decouple, as Thomas was saying, the purely technical component from the social technical, if you wish, uh, part. Okay. And it's proven to be a very complicated and indeed perhaps almost impossible uh, as of now. As you see already, certainly some technical work on AI standards being done by ISO, IEC, as uh, Thomas was mentioning before, uh, but also uh, the fact that increasingly you end up working on standards, for example, I try on human centric design that end up incorporating um, uh, some values of what is human centricity and what is the role of, I don't know, some fundamental human rights when you define human centricity. So the issue here is. Um, the more technology becomes pervasive and dual use, the more standards start incorporating more than technical information. And I'm not sure, I'm happy to discuss further with Thomas whether the coupling is that easy in the case of AI. 
or a number of future technologies. I, I can imagine standardization on data governance flows, uh, for example, and or privacy enhancing technologies. And that is uh, equally uh, controversial going forward, whether the decoupling can actually take place. There's a second trend, and perhaps I don't know if you and Claire will take that up in terms of you know uh, trends that I see in the standardization uh, uh, field that in my opinion is important. Regulation and standardization are conflating to a, to a large extent, are merging, because many regulations touch upon, uh, and AI is again a very good example here, ever-changing uh, technological subject matters, uh, such that only through a, a concrete standardization process can the regulation fully take shape. And this is what I see in the AI Act at the EU level, for example, where uh, the conformity assessment, which is indeed on trustworthy AI, so legally compliant, ethically aligned, the triumph of social technicality, if you wish, <laughs> and technical robustness, obviously, but the trustworthy AI is now being uh, uh, defined and subject to a, uh, a specific standardization process that would need to incorporate in a standard all those elements that are far from being deprived of a values and principles or legal or or, or any any uh, um, flavor that might potentially be the divisive in the global community. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the in the TTC that Thomas mentioned, the work to approximate the risk management framework and NIST with the conformity assessment at the EU level and potentially make this a broader process has a similar problem. So standards become much more than technical information in many cases, and they become more embedded in regulation uh, than they were before. And so this uh, also means standards become closer to national policy to some extent, and they become also distinctive traits to some extent of national legal, economic tradition, social cultural traditions. We see that incorporated in what I see increasingly as being bundled offers that not only, and this is to also answer some of the um, uh, uh, the questions that you have there, that you had there on screen, uh, the last one in particular um, uh, on, on the Global South, we see those bundled offers competing against each other, uh, not only the digital Silk Road and the side of China, but also the emerging idea of building a technology stack, perhaps integrated between so-called like-minded countries, as Thomas is saying, that would compete against that. So that is a scenario that is completely different from what, and I agree with Milton on this, is traditionally being a purely a, a global, truly global community, which is a community of standardization. We are in a completely different environment there where the forking is more evident. And I see this is also in the market data, meaning some companies, I think about Nokia or Ericsson that used to have, I don't know, maybe 20% of the revenues in China. Today, they have 2% of the revenues in China. So the, the forking also in terms of how the private sector can be uh, the um, uh, the stronghold of the globalization of standards. I mean, that is weakening in, in my opinion. So where are we in terms of scenarios as I come to, to uh, wrapping up? Uh, for a long time, we have thought, I don't know if the other speakers agree with me, that the best possible thing that could happen in between those two different types of standards is what we call a Y-shaped technology stack, where the, uh, the lower layers, the more technical, the more infrastructural are shared in the global community, the more you go into policy and values, the more you see the forking happening. Well, that's why shaped technology stack, a stack, I think, is leaving. And I agree with Milton with the word silly, perhaps, but it is. Uh, I see that happening, at least to some extent. Um, it is uh, um, paving the way and is uh, being replaced by a more splintered, a more forked um, uh, uh, global scenario, which I think is far from uh, from ideal. And I think there's a lot more to lose than uh, uh, than to gain from that, even if countries for other reasons that, I, that I'd like to discuss maybe later, if you're interested, perhaps even related to the pandemic and other emergencies that we've had, the idea of technological sovereignty, uh, reducing dependencies of other countries is further favoring and perhaps exacerbating this process. So finally, a footnote, um, one of the uh, um, signs of the emerging tensions there is the um, uh, uh, abuse, or I can say the global abuse of the word global if you pass me the term, meaning in AI, we have the global partnership on AI. It is not global. Uh, it has nothing that is global there. Uh, it is rather a G7 expression, right? To obviously a broader set of countries, but it is not global in nature. And we also have uh, the declaration on the future of the internet, which is obviously in everybody's mind these days, which is signed by 60 countries and far from global, even if the word global is incorporated in the declaration, 
And even if, uh, the you know, considering that the declaration then also adds some clear remarks that uh, uh, are quite critical of certain ways of approaching internet policy, they make it far from a global statement or even a, a, uh, a global um, uh, project, if you wish. So I'll stop there. Uh, and this is a little bit the, the trend that I see. Um, and um, perhaps for some of the solutions I, uh, we can discuss later and perhaps we find some. Uh, over to you, Robin, and thanks for having me again. Thank you, Andrea. Just a quick follow-up. Um, as you described the uh, EU kind of approach, both to AI uh, standardization and other areas, what do you think it would take uh, to have regions or even the US backtrack a little if they see their market um, shares diminish, as you just described for Nokia and Ericsson, for example. Do you think that this would cause a rethink or are we on the cusp of a rethink? What I was describing is a reduction of their market shares in China. Uh, and this obviously creates a uh, temptation to integrate the two markets uh, uh, across the Atlantic to create more market opportunities for uh, uh, players. Uh, Latin America, North America become uh, obviously uh, very attractive markets uh, and potentially potentially in the short term replacing uh, those revenues. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that this is a long-term strategy though, uh, meaning that uh, um, for the short term, and we are in a time of short-termism, I see this as an almost inevitable um, uh, uh, consequence. And I may add one example, uh, in the TTC, uh, again, uh, the Trade and Technology Council between the EU and the US that I'm following quite closely, uh, there is the project of creating a joint task force in one of the working groups for uh, deploying infrastructure and services in ICT in developing countries. So you see something that has never happened until very recently uh, is now potentially happening because it's clear that the technology stack that the Belt and Road Initiative or the Digital Silk Road in particular can offer to developing countries is much more complete and self-sufficient than what the US and the EU can do on their own. So this creates a little bit of a situation like if we were in an antitrust concept, it would be a market when there's a big company and other two that try to merge to try to, to stand the competition. Um, uh, if this leads to forking, um, I'm not sure that the, the global community will actually gain from this. Okay, thanks very much. And um, we come now to our fourth speaker, who is Dr. June Park. June, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Um, today, what I have been asked to do is to provide more of a, a perspective from the South Korean standpoint. And I do come from South Korea, and there have been very recent developments on Open RAN and standardization suggested by South Korea. So, what I'd like to do is also go question by question, but more addressing these details uh, from the South Korean take. Uh, for the first question regarding international standardization framework for critical and emerging technologies, um, I think that we did discuss 5G, 6G in the context of 3GPP co cooperation. But uh, Open RAN, if we think about this as a radio access network that enables 5G, 6G suppliers that can have an integrated sort of a system in which hardware, manu manufactured, manufactured hardware uh, is not really something that these, these suppliers have to uh, be constrained by and have a system in which they can choose from different array of options in terms of hardware, then it revolutionizes the, the system uh, quite much. And what South Korea has been trying to do uh, again, I do agree that this is not a global effort in, in that countries that dominate technology are at the forefront of this uh, move, but, and Korea is one of them, but domestically what these countries that need to appeal to Open RAN have to do is to present their own standards uh, that reflect, reflects their own environments in telecommunications to be accepted. And that's where the very gray area of like-minded countries that the value related issues come into because most of these countries that have uh, suggested their standards, they, they get along with each other so far. And secondly, is China a challenger? 
uh, uh, our second speaker did say that uh, China is not a challenger and more of a great contributor, but seen from countries that do not have the technology, it is a challenger. And countries that have to abide by uh, certain, um, uh, I would say, Western uh, sort of takes on this is, it's really difficult to see uh, countries aligning to both sides if they have mm -hmm. to adhere to both, if they have to adhere to a system. Uh, Korea is a hybrid system in this case because Korea has not completely outlawed Huawei in the Huawei ban, uh, Huawei ZTE ban. Um, China could be seen as a challenger in another regard regarding their data, data security law and the recently passed personal information protection law that is looking into national security as the prime interest, whereas the EU's general, general data protection regulation is more looking into the rights of the natural person. So going into the third question, um, national security and ethical concerns, of course, they've always been a, a critical issue. And uh, I think that given the, um, the tensions between the US and China and given the priorities of data protection laws in each jurisdiction that vary significantly, um, there is, very difficult, uh, you know, uh, I would say limited room for cooperation if this is exacerbated into the coming years. And then fourthly, uh, regarding state intervention, yes, this is likely to be the main feature uh, into the coming years, AI standard setting uh, for military equipment, probably military implementation, missile detection, firing, all of these things will come into the state intervention context. And uh, fifth, uh, regarding the main challenges to obstacles, uh, what ways could be used to increase cooperation? I think that mainly if we see it in a bifurcated way, so US sanctions and Huawei's e Huawei related China's economic coercion onto countries that abide by US sanctions, this is the main uh, critical element. Uh, the two factors really put countries at a test and sixth and last, the last response on the impact on global south. Uh, so South Korea does not belong in this category, but consider the countries that have to have that seek to have telecommunication strategy and want to follow up as a leapfrogger in the longer term, but do not have technology. They will have to choose a certain standard, but if they cannot come up with their own standard, they'll have to choose. And choosing would be a very, very political endeavor in this regard, or an economic issue regarding how much the cost is. So I'll end it there and I'll look forward to the questions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I do have a follow-up question for you. You mentioned the open RAN and uh, the decoupling of hardware from software. I guess the question I have for you is, do you see that decoupling is inherently um, risky in terms of security considerations for everyone, or is it more or less risky in some parts of the world? Uh, that is a very difficult. So you can't really put a finger on whether decoupling will arise in all areas or not. But what we know for sure is that a lot of the elements that are uh, considered for decoupling or any um, uh, U.S. move toward curb certain technologies in the context of decoupling is discussed. As as far as that component is, is concerned, I think that you know, ranging from semiconductors, um, net zero related technologies, or anything related to telecommunications, they are considered uh, in the context of national security at the same time as economic concerns. So we'll see certain um, technologies that are critical. So what we call CETs in this seminar, in this webinar, they will continue to have these stress tests regarding whether this is going to be decoupled or not. And we will continue to have uh, discussions on which companies get off the hook, which countries get off the hook. And that's going to create more tensions as we go on. Okay, thank you for that reflection. And we turn now to Robin, we cannot hear you right now. You ended up on mute. You're, you're muted. Sorry. 
I should know better. Um, we turn now to our last uh, panelist speaker, who is Dr. Bas Basun Yaan. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor. I have sent you the uh, uh, PPT on my presentation, and I will be brief. Mm, standardization governance domestic and international perspectives. When it comes to domestic, I mean Chinese domestic uh, reform on standardization. And when I'm talking about international perspective, I mean uh, the trade rules for standardization. So let's focus on the term international standards. The WTO definition for international standards is in effect not very clear. The TPT agreement and gets for trade and services mainly uh, said the organization should be open to at least all WTO members, and that, that's all. The other agreements like uh, SPS for food uh, safety is better because they mentioned three international uh, standardization organizations. And in the GPT committee, the US uh, proposed six principles for developing international standards, which was adopted as GBT committee decision. While EU still uh, focus on uh, ISO, IEC, ITU, and other international standardization organizations. Some other members like India mentioned the development development dimension. Uh, last year, trade in services, the Council for Trade in Services, guess, uh, reached some members, uh, around 60 members reached agreement on a reference paper on service domestic regulation where they mentioned technical standards. They are not talking about international standards. They just say the standards should be developed through open and transparent processes. At the same time, in the free trade agreements, members are pushing forward the definition for international standards. I'll give you an example which, uh, where uh, Korea uh, is members. One is EU, one is EU Korea FTA, another is EU US FTA. So you can say the differences. In the RCEP, where China is a member, uh, the six principles which has been pushed forward by the US has been uh, uh, written into the text. We can also see some uh, developments in uh, bilateral investment treaties especially the China EU BIT, that is comprehensive uh, uh, CEI, which was, uh, which is frozen cur currently, but at least uh, they uh, reach agreement. I have in effect written quite uh, 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 10 years ago uh, with the help of uh, Scott Kennedy, he published my paper in uh, the website on the website of Indiana University when he was a professor there. Uh, even though I mentioned the differences between the US and uh, EU, uh, I still have 
a lot of confidence that we could work out uh, ways to deal with the differences. And you can say you and the US have been working closely and working well on a standard setting. And so um, I'm confident and I'm sure China will do the same. China will work uh, pretty well with EU, US and others on standard setting, even though we are, to be honest, facing pretty hard time currently. China is still on the way of reformation, on the way of reform for standardization governance. Just uh, five years ago, we had a new law for standardization where one prominent point is firms are taking more and more lead in standard setting. At the same time, we have joined RCEP, and I have just mentioned the definition for international standards there. So what's the implication of the RCEP definition for international standards? I think we, of course, will value ISO, IEC, ITU as international setting, uh, setting uh, international SSOs as the EU uh, does. At the same time, we are open to uh, the definition of the United States as is written in the uh, RCEP. At the same time, currently in China, we are developing standard setting organizations of international characters. It is not the international standard setting organization. We're not uh, setting up SSOs like ISO. No, no, no. That's that's for sure. No, but we are setting uh, standard setting organizations with international characters. In Chinese, it is I, I know you could not understand it, but I just read it in Chinese. It is It is not. I'm sure there are room for further cooperation, even though we have problems currently. And I'm looking forward to talking with you more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the interest of time, uh, we will move on to the discussants, if that's acceptable. And then we'll come back and allow you to respond to each other and uh, address other questions. So our first discussant is uh, Dr. Scott Kennedy. Would you like to go ahead? Thank you. Sure. Well, uh, Professor Mansell, thank you so much uh, for hosting today and for Oxford for hosting this discussion. I've been a fan of the work of, of scholars there and elsewhere in Europe for a long time, and we've never had a chance to to have a bunch of meetings together. And it's been well well too many years uh, for me to interact with some of my colleagues in China who work on standards like Thomas and Bai Sheng. Um, but I just arrived in China a few days ago. I'm in quarantine right now. And in a few days, I'll get out. And I hope to go see Bai Sheng and everyone else who works on standards who's in Beijing. and. Um, continue the conversation that's been postponed for a little while. Um, I'm not your typical dragon slayer uh, in the Washington policy community, if you go look at what I've written, uh, but you all have pushed my defensive buttons, so I'm gonna have to defend America a little bit here. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised at the level of fatalism about decoupling, so you've pushed my optimism button, so I'm gonna have to push back there too. Usually. Uh, I fight for being the most pessimistic person in the room, but I don't think I'd win that today. So, and I have, I should say, I have a lot of respect for Huawei. Uh, I remember going to a meeting in 2014 or 15 at the state information at SIPO, this, uh, at the state IP office, 
and there was a uh, uh, they were releasing a rule on standard essential patents, uh, defending the this breadth of this rule, and 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 Huawei, I believe it was Thomas's boss, uh, Mr. Song, got up and made a very vigorous criticism of this very broad interpretation of standard essential patents, saying let the market decide. And I thought, hmm, there's a pretty interesting company right there. Um, and um, Huawei has learned uh, almost as better, better than anyone how to participate in setting standards and, and, and being very effective. Uh, there are other Chinese companies that participate that just pour a, a lot of, of uh, very um, limited uh, and weak standards proposals into the process that slow things down, but I think Huawei uh, doesn't fit in that category. Um, uh, it was mentioned uh, that we are in a period of, of digital neo-mercantilism, but I want to say, uh, and I, I would say I would agree, uh, but I think it's important to, to know how we got here. Um, and certainly the U.S. has done um, some things which are very inconsistent with... Oh, we lost your voice. Oh, can you hear me now? My... I didn't. You okay? I always heard him. I, I can hear him. All right. We can hear. Yeah. All right. So in any case, so the U.S. has done a lot of things inconsistent with what one would expect from a, a U.S. government with tariffs, uh, placing Huawei on the entity list, uh, expanding the uh, rule with the foreign direct product rule, um, passing ECRA export control restrictions, FIRMA on investment screening. Um, uh, at the same time, the Commerce Department issued an interpretation on standards, which said the U.S. couldn't participate in standard setting with companies that were on that were facing export control restrictions. Um, and those were, uh, you know, those were not that wouldn't have been my policy uh, plan. I wouldn't have responded that way. Um, but I don't think we, it's fair to say that the U.S. was unprovoked in what it did, right? Um, and that it's just simply trying to hang on uh, and protect its hegemony uh, without any any reason. Certainly, China's strategy of indi indigenous innovation announced in 2006, uh, its closed domestic standard setting system, which is still uh, discriminatory to today, uh, its government procurement rules, uh, some of the things that it's done uh, in, in, in how it's gone about promoting 5G, uh, which has touched off anxieties by the US, UK, uh, Japanese, and other governments. Um, uh, China's rules on national security, cyber data, uh, and now its full-scale self-reliance campaign. Um, those are, are, are things the US and others are responding to. Now, we can decide whether or not the U.S. ought to do it that way. Um, but uh, I think it's it's not that they're just responding to, to nothing. So I think what we're seeing is a back and forth between uh, two uh, countries operating uh, originally two different ways, but increasingly similar. We have very, they're increasingly uh, both practicing digital neo-mercantilism, uh, not just one side. And I think it's ironic that the U.S. is now working with uh, the Europeans on like-minded standards when it was the U.S. originally who was critical of China making standards all by itself. Uh, so we've sort of changed our, our roles in, in funny ways. But I don't think it, we should be so negative. Um, I do think that we are seeing some steps by American industry, European industry, and others to push back on this overreach. Um, and in fact, I think that's partly what's uh, resulted in last week, the US Commerce Department issuing a new rule uh, separating uh, export controls from participation in international standards, which I think is, is progress. Uh, I also think it's important to remember the US central federal government is quite weak. Uh, and so even if it comes out with rules, there's only so much it can do. Uh, ANSI, the U.S. Uh, you know body, which seems to you know supposed to be our national standard setter, is a very limited coordinating body. I think we're going to see hopefully Presidents Biden and Xi in a, in um, November meet and talk about ways we might lower the temperature in the relationship. 
Uh, and so I do think that there's some way, ways which we will avoid the most drastic types of decoupling in standards and elsewhere that we've talked about. I do think one area where I will be uh, pessimistic is the US and China and others fighting. No one in that, in that contest is representing the South, the global South. China doesn't represent the global South. China represents China. Uh, and neither really strongly represents consumers. So the global South and consumers still largely are unrepresented at the table. And, and, and that's why uh, the work Claire has done and others to give a voice to consumers are so important, which means I should stop and turn things over to her. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great segue into uh, Claire's discussion comments. Would you like to go ahead, Claire? Thanks very much, and thanks particularly, Scott, for giving me the perfect opening. Um, just to revert to Robin's introduction, um, although I have had some contacts with the standards world of many years, I've been doing it much more intensively in the last few years as part of the British Standards Institution's consumer and public interest network which sends people to take part in a selection of standards committees, by no means all of those which we usefully could contribute to, but as many as we can. And an important theme here, which applies to many types of stakeholders who aren't involved at the moment in the international standardization scene, or only marginally so, is being starved of resources and I may say that the body I belong to, which for short we call CPIN, um, is better resourced than most comparable bodies in other countries, though it does have counterparts elsewhere. But we feel desperately under-resourced. And one of the things I would like to suggest is that we can make some positive progress towards I won't say solving the challenges, but perhaps diminishing them, perhaps bringing together those two top strands of the why that Andrea referred to is by giving additional resources to underrepresented stakeholders, which are not going to be huge resources by the standards of what's going into international standardization at the moment, but they could make a huge difference. And um, going back to Scott, uh, yes, my, my optimism button has been pressed also, which is probably mostly a matter of uh, just my personality. I believe I'm an optimist generally, but also by the things that speakers so far have been saying. Maybe I have a slanted way of hearing what's been said but I felt that each of the speakers did actually give some grounds for optimism. And I'm not prepared to accept uh, what Scott said, that we should be pessimistic in the context of the underrepresented consumers. Rather, we should see them as an opportunity to be brought in and to affect things for the good. And, um, quoting from just a few of the remarks that the speakers have made. I, I couldn't possibly reproduce everything. It's been a very rich discussion so far. Um, I was interested that um, Thomas Lee early on um, drew attention to this uh, amusing term, like-minded standards, or uh, perhaps he introduced it but I would like to challenge the whole notion of like-minded countries. A country is not a single entity with a single mind. Uh, every country is a complex entity and the bigger the country is, and we've got two giants on the scene right now, the US and China, they're both very complex and they each of them have many minds at many different levels. <laughs> and the bulk of the discussion we've been having relates to the attitudes taken by national governments and by industry giants. And I do believe that if we were to bring in more participation by smaller companies, 
by consumer and user representatives, and in particular by the global south, um, that we would see that in each of these countries and, and all the rest, there's a whole spectrum of different attitudes, different opportunities for cooperation across, uh, for example, consumers, which is the ones I know something about. We already have European cooperation in the body ANEC. We have international cooperation within ISO, a wonderful term, COPOLCO, that's their Committee for Consumer Policy. And China is actually a member of Consumers International. I think there's half a dozen different consumer organizations in China who are just there ready to be brought into these debates. So uh, just looking to see what else I'd like to comment on from what the speakers have been saying. Um, Milton, uh, yes, I couldn't agree more about this term uh, critical and emerging technologies being um, a, a term of very little meaning and constantly changing. Uh, so do let us be more careful about our terminology in that and other respects as well. Um, already spoken about uh, the, the like-minded standards that Thomas introduced. Um, Andrea, trustworthy AI, thank you for trailing me there. Yes, that's one of my favorite topics and that's another one where we desperately need some proper definitions because I've listened to many discussions about trustworthy AI and my impression has been that the people taking part uh, were using different meanings of trustworthy and different meanings of AI. And so you can imagine we couldn't make a lot of progress in uh, producing trustworthy AI, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. And uh, June, yes, countries are going to have to choose. And uh, I, I think if we were to produce among us the resources to enable much more of the global south to make a meaningful contribution to these discussions, then that would be not just to their benefit, but to the rest of the world, because after all, those countries are all of our markets of the future. And um, Dr. Ann, yes, you, you mentioned the development dimension at the moment. Um, India was leading on that. Whether it will continue to be a leader, I don't know. But um, I think that they too can be leaders of the global south and of participation in the development of the standards. So I'll stop there and hand back to you, Robin, for our next stage. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, can I just say to the um, audience out there, if you would like to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, so far, I don't think we've had any, so please feel free to ask a question to all of the speakers or to someone specific. Thank you. Um, so we have had a very rich set of interventions and uh, responses. Um, what we seem to have here is a really intricate mix of politics and pragmatism, ideal, ideal, idealism, but also some of you have really emphasized the practice. It's not just all about what the wish list is for what might be, it's about who plays in the room. Um, I have myself once or twice participated in standard setting uh, working groups and um, what goes on is what goes on because of motivations of the individuals and to the extent that they're representing their countries or companies, what they see as the best way forward, whether they choose to block or whether they choose to open up and negotiate um, amicably for discussion. And so we have this sort of multi-leveled international, regional and national standardization exercise going on. And all of it matters hugely, not just for markets, but for citizens and consumers. Um, and for the companies and governments as well. So um, I think what I want to do is rather than pose specific questions to each of you, I don't think we have time. Um, what I'd like to do is throw that out and ask you to maybe reflect on that distance between the aspiration and the ideals that are um, articulated either by states or by companies and the actual practice. 
How do you see that unfolding in the near term in terms of cooperation possibilities? And so if each of you would like to intervene on that point or make a response to the discussants or to each other, please feel free. We still have um, half an hour. We'd like to reserve the last 10 minutes for questions if there are any, but if there aren't any, you have another sort of 25 minutes. So um, I open the floor up now in the light of those uh, reflections. Um, each of you should have a turn, but I don't necessarily want to go in linear order. So who would like to go first? Okay, June. Um, so how it would unfold, and uh, again, I'm limiting myself to the South Korean perspective, but uh, the open ran, uh, the, the standards uh, for the open alliance, OREN alliance that Korea suggested and was approved for, I think that would open up a lot of opportunities for Korean small and medium sized enterprises that work on these telecommunications man, uh, equipment goods because they would be in the running for um, uh, other foreign uh, um, requests or tenders uh, who are looking for. Uh, appro appropriate prices, uh, reasonable priced uh, equipment produced by different kinds of countries. And since, because the standardization that has been approved will apply to these appliances, Korea would be expanding its uh, 5G frontier. And um, we'll have to see how this unfolds into the next couple of years uh, as 6G is developed and uh, there is going to be a competition on 6G. So we'll see how this unfolds. But uh, once a country suggests a standard and it is approved, that also signals to uh, further opportunities. So competition as well as opportunities. Okay, thank you. Next. Like uh, in, hello, know. or Thomas, go ahead. Then I'll. Thomas. Uh, I'll... Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'd like to respond for the uh, uh, several previous speakers. First of all, thank you, Claire. I like your challenge for the like-minded countries. <laughs> uh, and also, I think uh, I'd like to appreciate the squad that uh, don't put uh, Huawei in the evil list, <laughs> even. <laughs> Even though uh, I, I have some maybe have technical uh, network problems to hear all your uh, speakers, the major thing I'd like to respond to is to uh, Andrew and the uh, difficulties of decoupling from uh, uh, between standards and the regulation and the values. Uh, technically, I think it's very easy. It's a traditional standard way. All the countries work together and have consensus building. I and mean, we, if we can build consensus that international, international uh, global standards, if we, if we can't, we leave back to own countries. So that is a practical way. Uh, let me make an example on that. I, I can see that uh, Mr. Phil Wimber, also on the, uh, on the audience list, uh, he's the uh, JDC1 chairman. Uh, uh, SC42 is doing a very good job on the AI, AI uh, uh, trustworthiness. Uh, they are doing the standardization over there that everybody take part, in, including China, uh, EU, and the United States, everybody together. We have a lot of consensus over there. So it's possible to decouple, unless a lot of people intensively don't want that to happen. If they strongly bundle values and the technology together, we got a fragmented standards, no global. So, uh, we can say that technology is honest. It's only zero and one. Finally, if we, if we uh, you know, technology will not lie, right? Finally, we, we can have a rich uh, consensus, but if we put on the political things and the consen uh, values, there are too much differences and uh, maybe have lies transparency as well. So maybe you have 100 years uh, uh, have consensus over there. It's not, it, sometimes impossible. So it's all about the intentions of everybody in the room, in the meeting room. Are we going to have a global standards consens consented or we dislike it? That's all our choice. So that's my uh, answer on that. Another point is that, Andrew, you mentioned that is uh, Ericsson Nokia's uh, uh, market share in China from 20% to 2%. <laughs> that's an interesting uh, observation. You know, 
Uh, let's go back to the, uh, the, the point of view of uh, uh, China operators like China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom. They dislike only one company to become the vendor. They like multi-vendor supplier environment very much. So why does that happen? I think there's going to be some kind of another reason. Maybe they uh, put less investment in China, or maybe they have uh, less uh, less the services over there, or maybe they have uh, not so good products. I don't know. Maybe we we need some uh, investigation on that. But it's not Huawei to pay the money. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, the operators pay the money. So they dislike that situation. If that really happened. We got to find out the what's behind. That's uh, my uh, res responding on that. So I'm not occupying all the time. I'd like to respond to all the things, uh, the questions right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe we come to Andrea next. All right, thank you, Robin. Uh, two things very quickly. One is uh, on, on my observation on Ericsson and Nokia, just to clarify. Uh, I'm observing and and uh, and collecting uh, data, but obviously I have no personal stake in in any of this, and I don't have a an opinion as whether this is positive or negative. But as a as an academic, I observe what are the 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 ties between different countries that could be represented by the fact that companies have a presence, right? And so the private sector not only has been the real glue of the internet since the very beginning, obviously, uh, from uh, technical experts to uh, to entrepreneurs and and uh, and and users, of course, uh, but the private sector could also be the one that uh, convinces uh, by insisting for a global market, uh, convinces the, the, the global superpowers to continue cooperating. And uh, for me, talking with many industry people, um, the, the fact that there will be two different technology stacks developing or, or three uh, in the future is something that has been taken almost for granted by many, many market commentators over the past five, six years at least. And that is, I don't know whether others will sh share this, uh, this observation, but I think that is, uh, that is important. And uh, um, so in observing what are the future incentives for uh, um, keeping the um, uh, standardization world united and, and cohesive as opposed to a forking or, or a splinter net. I mean, that is something that I, that I, that I, I wanted to, uh, to note and observe. Um, I don't know whether this is due to the quality of products or not, of, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, but certainly uh, it is something that has been changing in the market over the, over the past few years. The second thing I wanted to say to respond directly to Robin, uh, to Robin's question is that uh, perhaps complementing what I said in the first part of my intervention is that as standards increasingly become socio-technical and increasingly incorporate values and principles uh, and to some extent even uh, um, legal compliance at the highest level, uh, uh, you know, the, the more this happens, the more uh, we actually need, and this is for Claire as well, uh, the participation of civil society and smaller uh, companies and the global south in the definition of standards. So while on the one hand, um, it is clear that uh, the, the standardization community has been a global community until now, it is also clear that even without the temptation to splinter or to fork and so on, uh, the fact that standards are becoming so much deeper and, and more dense with um, um, uh, uh, ethical and legal considerations, uh, even without, uh, as I was saying, the, 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 the geo geopolitics of it, we would still be, uh, uh, we, we would still need to work on uh, including civil society, including other voices in the setting of standards. Uh, obviously the fact that there is the additional geopolitical tension makes it even more important. So I hope that uh, the support that uh, Claire was invoking actually materializes because I think it's a very good idea, especially in specific standard setting uh, contexts to make uh, the uh, the process a little bit less cryptic and technical and, and, and to bring in uh, the voices that then uh, correspond to the end users, but also the future developers of technologies. And, uh, and civil society as a whole. Uh, I saw there was a question, I might uh, get back to this in the Q&A, um, uh, uh, but I don't wanna take too much time. So I'm, I uh, give you back the floor, Robin, and perhaps if I have a chance later, I will talk about the like-minded uh, from an institutional perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, Milton. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> a lot of complex material to address here. And um, 
I don't know where to begin, but uh, let me begin with Scott's observation <clears throat> that the U.S. was provoked. And uh, uh, in terms of this dynamic of digital neo-mercantilism, I have to agree that uh, China is uh, not some kind of innocent victim here. Uh, one observation I would make, however, is that uh, in my research, I discovered that Huawei started to be targeted surprisingly early. I mean, like 2008 and 2009. Uh, and this is one of the odd things about the U.S. targeting of Chinese companies is that we, uh, because they are exposed to the global markets, we tend to hit the most open, internationally competitive, and, and least dangerous firms first. I'm talking about the Huawei's, the Alibaba's, the TikTok's. These are all really commercially motivated companies. They're not uh, Trojan horses for the, the Chinese state. Uh, and they seem to be interested in mostly in making money. But there's no doubt about it, Chinese, uh, Chinese mercantilism and imperialism is uh, partly responsible for this dynamic. And I think what we need to be talking about is how to uh, mitigate or get out of that dynamic. So China's uh, policies are horrible. They have uh, data nationalism, they have uh, censorship, they, they have tech nationalism. Uh, the, their attitudes towards Hong Kong did so much to discredit them uh, in the West. Uh, their attitudes towards Taiwan are leading them towards a, a kind of a Russia-Ukraine situation uh, and makes everything uh, cast in a military and national security kind of a, a, an environment. The, the point I'd like to point out is that by weaponizing chips and telecom equipment, the U.S. is reinforcing these tendencies. Right? You know, it's, we're not working through the WTO and trying to bring them into compliance with free trade rules. We are, we are militarizing technology, and I can only see that increasing China's tendency to go down that mercantilist path. One, uh, So I would really like some ideas about how we get out of that. Uh, one last point, uh, I want to address values and technology. I don't know if you're aware that I've written some about this. Um, and I agree with Thomas that we cannot think of standards negotiations as ways of imposing our values you know, on people, right? And that's, first of all, it's not that really the way it works. Uh, values or sort of normative and institutional values uh, are implemented in, in the way you adopt and implement a technology. You know, you can run TCP IP in North Korea and it's the same technical standard, but North Korea is North Korea and the US is the US in terms of the institutional and legal and normative values of those two countries. It's not have anything to do with the technical features of how packets are formatted, right? So you need to um, inter, disentangle those those questions and come up with compatibility relations first and foremost and let people who are implementing the technologies and and people who are passing laws and regulations worry about the values i'll stop there okay thanks milton we have generated some questions from the public audience and we have very little time left so um i think you've been able to see them perhaps uh what I can do is to say that uh, one point that has been mentioned is to welcome the references to civil society and their importance. And one of the questions is really, a, I won't read it out, but it's really about whether or not you see any possibility of the kinds of processes which have been um, inherent in the multi-stakeholder internet governance setting where civil society does play a role in governance as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to think of alternative models and ways forward for standardization in a way to um, maybe potentially avoid some of the conflicts and difficulties that are being faced. The other one that I ask you maybe to address uh, briefly is to come back to this issue of like-mindedness, uh, which has been discussed a couple of times. I know that Andrea had something more to say about that, but you may all also um, want to provide another final comment on the separation, if you like, of uh, values from uh, technical standardization. So um, enough from me. Uh, very quickly, who would like to address these questions from the public? <clears throat> 
I can address the first one about. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, I have a lot of experience in uh, ICANN, and that was deliberately set up as a non-governmental entity for uh, coordinating the domain name system. And I do think that that is, in fact, the approach that should be taken with respect to, you know, critical global standards. That if you bring geopolitics and nation states too deeply into that standardization process, you're going to get. Uh, the subordination of the technology to military and political concerns. So one way of avoiding that is to have a civil society driven private sector led standardization process. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, somebody? Maybe I'll Andrea? check in. Uh, okay. So normally a good rule is that if you want to provoke others, you have to do it four minutes before it's over, right? Uh, it finishes. So the, <laughs> no, first, first of all, I share Milton's comment on the fact, as I said before, civil society would perhaps um, uh, um, uh, be the force that potentially uh, turns the tide in, uh, in global standardization. But uh, first of all, in the mobilization of civil society, uh, um, we have to ask ourselves whether that is divisive per se, whether it's uh, as easy to mobilize civil society in China or in other countries as it is in other parts of the world. So it could be seen as a way to tilt the balance in favor of some countries as opposed to others. And um, uh, and uh, perhaps that is uh, something that we should reflect upon, whether there's a meaningful way of doing this in a way that represents all the countries and obviously including the global south and what i'm also wanted to say is that perhaps what is happening uh, what has been happening over the past few years and i don't know if you agree with me but this is something that i've been discussing on and on with experts uh, in the field is it's actually the other way around so there is an overall accusation mostly from the west towards china of having transformed the world a world that was largely bottom up and private se sector led into a state orchestrated uh, strategy, meaning a participation in standardization organizations around the world that is uh, 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 really uh, organized and coordinated uh, from the state side. So, uh, and so this triggering a an equally organized response, if you wish, in the future on the side of the U.S. and potentially the EU and other countries. Um, I don't know whether you agree with this or not, but this is uh, at least on the U.S. side, a story that I've heard uh, uh, several times. So maybe Scott has something to say about this or others. And finally, on the like-mindedness, I can only be very brief. Um, I think we've discovered over time uh, that uh, to be like-minded with all the caveats that Claire has specified is one thing. To have similar incentives in economic terms, in legal and uh, tradition terms, and, and institutional structure terms is a completely different thing. Uh, one quick example is what happened in the uh, TTIP, uh, in, in the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership between the US and the EU a few years ago, where on things like risk regulation, uh, there seemed to be an, an intuitive convergence, whereas in the end, uh, the structure in legal terms is completely different. The litigation system in the US uh, makes exempt controls less needed. Uh, the lack of this big litigation apparatus in the EU makes exempt controls and thereby, um, if you wish, uh, certain regulatory structures more needed. And so it's very difficult to converge, uh, even you know when you have intuitively uh, common values on common solutions. Sorry. Okay, thank you, uh, June. Any final remarks? Responses uh, as to the much questions? as we are concerned about this like-mindedness, I think it is a little bit too uh, abstract for us to keep using this language because, uh, of course, there are going to be like-minded. Ness, but every country, as I mentioned in my remarks, has a different way of going about data protection, data regulation, and it varies by jurisdiction. So what we need to focus on is how these differences will actually apply into reality. And if ever there is a regional or multinational, multilateral um, effort, whether that is really efficient or useful to uh, each jurisdiction or not. So, because those are the areas where the clear um, divide of interests amongst winners and losers will be apparent. So with, uh, rather than just flocking to this term of like-mindedness, we need to pay attention to what really divides winners and losers. Okay, thank you, Scott. Sure. Um, I think like-mindedness, um, is an American synonym for countries that practice democracy and rule of have rule of law. I think that's really what it's meant to be, and it's, it obviously is meant to uh, not include China or authoritarian countries in general. 
because of the the view that um, one the that you can't disassociate standards and technology from from values, and two, you need systems of accountability and and things like that. So I think we're, um, you know, how do you go about ensuring the the rights of of participants and consumers and and for reasonable protections from national security? I don't think we're going to get away from that, but I agree it's a it's a it's a word that's designed uh, with. Uh, that type of in, intention. I, I would just say that more broadly, the standards world, when I first started paying attention 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the, the main contest was about rents. Who got the rents? Was which technology provider got the rents, uh, et cetera. And I remember when I was here, you know, in the late 90s, it was, you know, the Chinese were really upset from 2G that they were paying exorbitant licensing fees and to the DVD forum. And the Chinese learned how to respond and, and now they collect rents themselves. But in the process, we then came, up, uh, we didn't solve the, the rents problem because there's still consumers in the South that aren't uh, getting, their, they're getting things at the price that they ought to. And there's monopolies and things like that. But we then came across and added on the national security level challenge. and while we're, while the train is still moving and we and the international standard system isn't really set up intentionally to deal with that problem because it's meant to be consensual and national security interests are meant to be zero sum so i think we're going to have a it'll be very difficult then you add on this question of values uh, i do think the chance the our ability to do multi-stakeholder standard setting will help um, i do think uh, another thing that will help is if the US and others got a little bit more self-confidence. I think they saw what Thomas and his team were doing and they were pretty scared. Um, and I think if you just get a little more self-confidence and be willing to mix it up, um, that will we'll, uh, be willing to get back in the game. So I think maybe the US overshot a little bit the last few years. And I think we're gonna revert hopefully to the norm again and um, I still think there's some real, real challenges that folks have mentioned with regard to China and the US, but I think there's a variety of different ways and I think you'll see some adjustments in tactics soon. Okay, thank you. Um, we are going into overtime now. I must not be a very good chair, but I do want to give very quickly Thomas and um, Dr. Ang a chance. So if you could be very brief, then we will have to draw this to a yeah, conclusion. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. So. Uh, it's uh, I'd like to introduce uh, just like uh, Scott mentioned the multi stakeholder. This is a good uh, mechanism uh, that I can and uh, I saw is uh, insisting on that is good uh, regulation way on the internet. Uh, we totally agree with that kind of uh, way on the global network and the global standards. And the only threat on that one is uh, what I can see is that is a clean network plan of the U U US government. So uh, in the multi-stakeholder mechanism, the, the governments only have one vote in ICANN. I think that's good enough to, to keep the, the globalization. That's my uh, response. Thank you very much. OK, and Dr. Ang, very briefly, because a couple of speakers have to go. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, security is a key, uh, a key concern, uh, but I'm still confident about future cooperation because I've been working on that for 10 years. It is common criteria, information security by the EU and the US. However, even under that framework, cooperation is still going on. So I'm definitely confident for the future cooperation, but at the same time, we need to work really carefully on how to cooperate at the time being. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the, it remains to me to thank all of our panelists uh, to ask Claire to forgive me for not having her on again, but she's going to have a voice because she's going to be co-authoring the report that will come out of this webinar. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has learned a lot. I suppose my final remark is to say that in the contemporary geopolitical arena, it's not very surprising that we have different views on the standardization process. And what we must hope for is that the development of 5G, 6G 
and AI actually does meet the aspirations of those who are the technology developers and is consistent with consumer and citizen interests. And so I'll stop there. I thank you enormously. I thank the um, global, uh, the Oxford Global Society for organizing this session. And I wish you all very well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. your sharing. Thank you, Robbie. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.